Trey's going to shoot me. 193. <laughs> Don't kill me, Trey. All right, calm down. <laughs> There's a lot to the vision section. Let's talk about sound. I'm sorry. Sound is your ability to sense vibrations in the air. Right now you're hearing me because my vocal cords are vibrating. Any sound you hear is vibration. If I hit the desk, you heard that because the desk vibrated, air is touching the desk, so as the desk vibrates back and forth after I hit it, the air vibrates back and forth. And these molecules vibrate and hit these molecules which vibrate, which hit these molecules and vibrate, and that vibration propagates through the air at what's called the speed of sound which is about 700 miles an hour or something like that. It depends on your altitude. Medium. And so um, your ear has a way of recording this and sending messages to your brain. Um, we divide up sound into three different qualities. Loudness is related to the intensity of the wave. Uh, if you study waves in physical science, which you all should have by now, the height of the wave is basically known as the amplitude. And the higher the amplitude of the sound wave, the greater the sound. Now, sound waves are a different kind of wave. They're not transverse waves like this, but they're longitudinal waves that kind of move like an accordion does could imagine an accordion moving through the air. That's kind of how sound waves move. But the intensity of the waves is the loudness. And that's measured in, do you know what the measurement is for intensity? Decibels. Decibels. Decibel is a logarithmic scale. So it goes from, it starts at zero. Zero decibels is the quiet, the faintest sound you could hear, basically defined as zero decibels. And then it goes up 10, 20, 30. And it's a logarithmic scale. So every time you go up 10 decibels, you're getting 10 times as loud. So if you go up from 20 decibel sound to a 40 decibel sound, that's 10 times louder, 100 times louder. You see? So going up 20 decibels is getting 100 times the amplitude of the wave. So what if you went up 30 decibels from 20 to 50? How many times louder would it be? 1,000 times louder. Your ear has an ability to pick up changes in sound that are hundreds of thousands or even millions of times. The loudest sounds, you know, something like a jet engine is like 140 decibels, if you're wondering. The, the sound, the volume I'm speaking at is about 65 decibels. Pitch, the dimension of auditory experience related to the frequency of a pressure wave. So when we're talking about frequency, we're talking about how many waves per second? So this would be a low frequency wave versus this being a high frequency wave. I'm real good at drawing waves, by the way. The more waves per second, the higher the sound. So many waves per second. Pretty good. <laughs> Working on a one-man show. <laughs> Taking the Broadway. Lower sound, like like my car in the morning. I get here before y'all do, but it's. 
the bass speakers I have are just kind of shake the school, but I'm the only one here, so <laughs> the only one gets to experience it. So, uh, what do we measure pitch in? Do you all know? Those of you know about sound? Hertz. Hertz means waves per second. And so if you only have 20 hertz, then your ear is vibrating, your eardrum is vibrating 20 times a second. 20 vibrations a second. So see my hand moving right here? That's about two vibrations per second. So you can't hear it. But if I could move it back and forth 20 times a second, you'd hear Isn't that cool? And if I could move it 20,000 times a second, you'd hear. I don't think we'd hear it at all. It's like, isn't that one for babies? The ear can hear between, the normal normal human hearing is between 20 and 20,000 hertz. 20,000 being the highest, 20 the lowest. Now, dogs and bats can hear higher than 20,000 hertz, up to 30 or 40,000 hertz. I think they said that uh, dolphins can hear up to 80,000 hertz. And they communicate with one another, dolphins do, at frequencies, and so do bats, at higher than we can even hear. And elephants can hear all the way down to 5 hertz, and elephants communicate at frequencies lower than you can hear. And one lady famous for figuring that out, she's studying elephants, and she could feel her chest shaking when she was around the elephants, but she couldn't hear anything. So and that was the sound them. waves that so they were elephants making. elephants could be speaking English and there's no way for us to know? That's right, unless you can hear that low. Yeah, good question. Very nice. I can tell you're thinking about this stuff. <laughs> Timbre. The distinguishing quality of a sound. The dimension of auditory experience related to the complexity of the pressure waves. Some sounds are pure waves. But some sounds are combinations of a lot of different waves, and you get a resultant. And so the purity of the wave is, is the timbre. And that's why, for instance, um, you know, G played on a guitar is different sounding than G on a piano. Um, they have different uh, ways that the strings are vibrating to create that pitch. And so they have different timbres as well. This is how the ear works. <coughs> Somebody you. grabs a very tiny horn and blows it next to your ear. And the sound waves come through the ear. The outside of the ear is that shape to focus the sound waves. It then vibrates the eardrum, which sits right there. And the eardrum is attached to three little bones. And those three bones can soften the sound or can amplify the sound, depending on how loud it is. If it's not very loud, the three bones amplify it. And if it's real loud, the three bones will soften it. They're set in such a way that they'll do that. Um, and there they, it shows them up close. By the way, those are the three smallest bones in the body, the malleus, incus, and stapes. The stapes is the smallest bone. If you want some, some of you trivia people out there might, might know that. And then that vibrates fluid that's in this snail-shaped structure here. This snail-shaped structure is called the cochlea. And it's full of little hairs that are attached to nerve cells. And as the sound vibrates through the cochlea, the hairs bend. And the hairs bend based on the length of the wave. So if you have really long waves, the only hairs that are bending are toward the end. And if you have really short waves, the hairs near the beginning are bending. And that's how the brain distinguishes whether it's a low sound or a high sound. So if you're listening to an orchestra, which has all these different sounds coming in at once, lots of the hairs in your cochlea are bending, sending signals to the brain. Your brain might be getting 10,000 signals a second from your ears to try and make sense of the sound you're hearing. It all goes through the auditory nerve, which goes through the brain. 
And by the way, there's a couple of loops here that sit up top of this cochlea, sit right here next to it. And those uh, are your sense of balance because they have little floating uh, uh, kind of uh, fluid in there that bends hairs as you move your head one way or the other. So that gives you a sense of balance. Questions about any of this? Are you, you getting me there? Oh, yeah. Very nice. Here's the little structure of the little hairs I told you about inside the cochlea that bend and send signals. And this kind of shows how it works, this animation. Sound waves strike the tympanic membrane and cause it to vibrate. Oops. Vibration of the tympanic membrane causes the three bones of the middle ear to vibrate. The footplate of the stapes vibrates in the oval window. Vibration of the foot plate causes displacement of the basilar <coughs> membrane. Short wavelengths from high pitch sounds cause displacement of the basilar membrane near the oval window. This movement is detected by hair cells of the spiral organ. Long wavelengths from low pitch sounds cause displacement of the basilar membrane far from the oval window. Again, this movement is detected by hair cells of the spiral organ. So, as this way, as the waves move through, move through the plate here, you can see they're pushing down on this membrane. And that activates the little hairs that are right here in the middle that they're not showing. They're microscopic. It's too small to see in the, even this blown up picture. And when those hairs bend, they send a signal. A signal off to the brain. There's what the hair cells look like. This is taken from a rat who lived in a quiet cage for all for its life. And you can see the little hair cells there. Those are the hairs. And this next picture was taken from a rat who was kept in a cage where they played real loud music its whole life. And you can see the hairs are all disrupted. So normal cage, loud music cage. This is why old people can't hear very well. Do you all have that thing on your phone that plays a tone? Yeah. And old people can't hear it? Actually, I don't have that. Anymore. And young people can? Does anyone have that? This other thing has it. I can't hear the... the the tone that young people can hear. I've lost my hearing. And that comes from a lifetime of listening to loud things. Um, the less loud music you hear, the better your hearing will be when you're older. And other loud activities. People who do yard work should wear ear protection. Because if they're mowing all the time, or blowing, and have this loud engine near them, they'll lose their hearing over that. Very well documented. What are the, about some of the other senses? Um, taste, this is on page 196. Hold on, let me make sure here that I'm doing it right. Yeah. The sensation of taste comes from molecules of your food that dissolve in the mucus that's in your mouth. And then go down here into a taste bud. Your tongue is covered with hundreds or thousands of these pap papillas, what they're called, which are little bumps. And down on the walls of the bumps, you have little collections of cells called taste buds. And the food that you're eating kind of dissolves and goes down here, the molecules do, and they attach to little villi, little hairs, on the end of these taste cells. And the little hairs have protein receptors on them of certain shapes. And so it has one shape that'll catch sugar <laughs> molecules. It has the right shape to catch sugar molecules. So if it catches a sugar molecule, it sends a taste sensation to your brain of sweet. And if it catches a 
fat molecule, it sends a taste sensation of fat. And these have certain tastes, you see. And your brain is wired to like sweets and fats and not to like poisons. And that keeps you from eating things that are bad for you. And so most poisons have a real bitter taste. And most things that are good for you have a real good taste. But it's not always so. Because some things that are good for you to taste good to one person and bad to another. And so there's some, you're born with, a, with certain tendencies. And so if your parents don't like something, it's probably, you, you, you're likely to be born not liking that. But you can also change your tastes. If you try something and the body doesn't get sick over it, the brain goes, hey, that was nutritious. I got energy from it. And I didn't get sick. So the brain changes a little bit so you'll like it. And it's a surefire thing that you can change your taste. If you want to, take, what's, what's, what do you, what's your worst food, McLean? What don't you just can't stand? Mm -hmm. Potato salad. Potato salad. If you try well, a little I, I potato, potato salad, salad, and don't try stale potato salad that'll make you sick, but if you try a little potato salad and, and just do a little, once a week maybe for several weeks, you'll change your taste and you'll start to like it. It's amazing the body can change. And so that's why parents, if they, they just try to get their kids to try something, they'll start to like it. And it'll change without you knowing it. You'll one day put potato salad in if you've done that a few times, and you'll go, hey, that's pretty good. Yeah, but I've been eating eggs like my whole life, and I still hate you eggs. You still hate them and you eat them anyway? Yeah. Well. <laughs> I mean, my mom cooks them, so I'm not going <laughs> to. Maybe, maybe, she, maybe she cooks rotten eggs. Maybe. Like um, <laughs> for the most terrible. part, you can change your taste, yeah? What? How come, isn't alcohol a poison? Why do people like, like that? Well, alcohol is only poisonous in large quantities. Your liver can tear up the alcohol, and so it cannot be poisoned. Okay. So when you first taste it, it usually gives you a bad taste because it is something that's bad in large quantities. But if you, if you drink some of it, and you do that a few times, your brain will go, wait a second, we can handle this. It's giving us energy. Alcohol is very high in, in, uh, in uh, ATP. It'll, it'll give you a lot of energy. So um, your brain can learn to like it, just like anything else. Um, but yeah, in too high concentrations, it'll, uh, it'll cause yeah. sickness. Caffeine's the same way. Most kids don't like caffeine <laughs> when they first try it, and then they get used to it. Um, papillae... All right, there, those are the little bumps on your tongue. That's what your tongue looks like under an <laughs> electron microscope. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. yeah, to, like, cover something with a certain substance if you're trying to look through it with an electron microscope? Yes, for a scanning electron microscope like this, it has to be covered in gold. So they covered a guy's tongue in gold? No, nah, they, well, they took, <laughs> they took a piece of some guy's tongue and then covered that in gold on a slide. Yeah. And it might not, this might not be some guy's tongue, it might be a lab rat's tongue or something like that. Rat's tongue. Smell kind of works the same way as taste. Smell and taste are, are uh, almost the same receptors. It's just one is wired to a different part of the brain than another. So one is wired to the part of the brain that senses taste, and another part of the brain senses smell, but they work the same way. They're hairs called villi hanging from cells at the top of your nose. And you breathe in the rose and particles that are in the flower come off the flower and go into your nose. When they touch these hairs at the top of your nasal cavity, the molecules bind with receptors that are on the surface of these cells and if the re correct receptor binds, it'll send a message to the brain. I think this is the one I want to show you. This kind of shows how it works. And just keep in mind, no, uh, this is an I don't know what that thing is. So, oh, it is this. We can distinguish up to 10,000 different smells, which language is not equipped to describe. How do you describe the smell of a sunny afternoon? Uh, 
We are literally bathed in smells, as odor molecules are floating around us all the time. Every breath draws millions of these molecules up into the nostril. The stream of molecules winds its way right up to a small patch at the top of the nose. This area is packed with millions of nerve cells that can register smells. The odor molecules dissolve in the sticky mucus surrounding the tips of these cells. Each nerve ending is studded with tiny receptors that will react to only one specific kind of molecule. Once the odor molecules lock into the correct receptor, they trigger electrical impulses. These signals feed straight into the brain area that controls emotion and memory. That explains why smells are so good at bringing back memories and influencing our mood. The conscious part of the brain eventually translates all the electric signals from the nose into what we perceive as a smell. So ultimately, we smell with our brains. big sense in most animals, but it's not that big in humans because humans walk upright. And smell molecules are really usually pretty heavy and sit close to the ground. So you can't get much out of your sense of smell. A dog is on all fours and it's always got its nose right next to the ground, so it can pick up all this information just by smelling. Dog can recognize someone in the dark by their odor and uh, have no problem tracking, you know, something that walked through maybe even a day before. Because you, whether you know it or not, you have odor molecules leaking through the soles of your shoes. That's how the, the, the soles of your shoes look solid, but they actually have microscopic little holes in them. And your odor molecules can fit through them and you leave a trail of odor molecules, and a, a dog, which has something like a 50 times more smell receptors than humans, can follow that with no problem. It's almost like they can see a different part of the world than we can. It's pretty cool. Look at this experiment. This is pretty neat. Red bars show the people who could identify a substance dropped on the tongue when they were able to smell it. So in other words, they drop lemon on your tongue and you ate or 90%, almost 90% of the people correctly identified that it was lemon. The blue bars show how well they did if their nose was covered up. So they put a clothespin on their nose, then they drop the lemon on there and only 40% of the people correctly identified lemon. Isn't that a cool experiment? That's a good idea for an experiment. Something like that. Um, of course, that one's already been done. You'd have to change it around a little bit. Somebody did that one year in my class, and they used different flavors of Skittles, I think. And the person had to correctly identify the different flavor of Skittles. And when they were, had their nose stuffed up, they were very bad at it. It was a pretty good project. That's good because every Skittle is shaped the same, so there'd be no way to identify it by its shape or texture. These are your skin senses. Touch, warm, cold, pain, itch, and tickle. They all have their nerve receptors in your skin that can sense all of those. Different areas of the skin have different amounts of receptors. The most nerve receptors are in your fingers, 
and lips and tongue. As a matter of fact, there's more nerve receptors in your tongue and lips than there are on the tips of your fingers. That's why babies put objects in their mouth. Because they're trying to learn about it. They're trying to feel it as well as they can, and they quickly learn that the best place to feel something from is their mouth. If you really want to tell what shape something is, you put it in your mouth. And you can imagine, you can go, oh yeah, I see what that shape is. Fingers are good. You know where the least nerve receptors are? Elbow. What'd you say? I said elbow. Elbow is correct. Is it yeah, your elbows and your knees have the least nerve receptors. And you could pinch your own elbow, and it usually doesn't even hurt, hardly. Try it. You could try it right now. Pinch your elbow. Very few pain receptors or any receptors there. <laughs> pain is something that's been studied a lot in medicine, and it's nerves. There are nerve fibers that send pain signals, but it's, it's very interesting psychologically that if you're playing a ball game or something, and you're, you're very high in adrenaline, um, you don't notice the pain from the game, you, you notice it after. And there's a lot of different theories on how pain works. And one theory is called the gate control theory. And it says that there are gates located along the spinal cord at different places that can be opened or closed. And if the gate is open, pain signals can get to the brain. And if it's closed, pain signals will not get there. It's a, and they don't know what exactly that gate is or how it works. But uh, it's an interesting theory, so I want you to kind of read about it. They have a paragraph or two on it. The neuromatrix theory of pain says there's a lot more that goes into pain than just the nerve signal itself. Your memories, your emotions, your expectations, your attention, are all psychological factors that feed into the total amount of pain. If you're expecting pain, and you're scared of pain, and you're worried about pain, usually you're going to feel more pain. So kind of a kid, you know, if he's going to get a shot, and his, and his buddies say, oh, you're going to go get a shot today? It's going to hurt real bad. And the kid goes, I don't know, I don't want to get a shot. And they're all worried about it. It's going to hurt them a lot more than if the kid never knew anything about it and the doctor says, okay, this isn't going to hurt a bit. You ever hear him say that? He said, don't even worry about this. This is fine. And then if, if you're not expecting it and you're not thinking there's going to be any pain, usually there's less pain. So there's a psychological aspect. That, other than just the sense itself, there's a lot that goes into it. And we call that the neuromatrix theory of pain. And they devote a... Uh, a couple paragraphs on that. We don't really understand exactly what it is and how pain works. It's kind of like we don't understand how memories work or how sleep works. So there's these theories, these ideas that go into maybe how it works. So they devote some time in the book to that. Oh, this is the next section. Okay, so um, if you would, read through page 201 tonight, 193 to 201, and we are continuing the video on synesthesia. Can you, uh, you can turn that off for me now.